hello again. All right, we are closing our day with Sky Moray. Sky is the chair of the Collaborative Design and Design Systems MFA and MA program at Pacific Northwest College of Art at Willamette University. And there she has a lot of students in the room, so I want to hear all from the students. Woohoo! You'll be graded on how loud you applaud, right, Sky? Sky will address engaging design for an unstable world in her talk this afternoon. She is currently inspired by youth, of course, but youth climate and collaborative justice movements, generative typography, indexal design, open source publishing efforts, and patterns in nature. She is currently listening to Corona Under the Ocean, a podcast series exploring the impact of COVID-19 pandemic crisis on ocean research as well as its effects on our oceans. And not surprising, if she could hang out with any fictional character, it'd be Dr. Seuss the Lorax. Please join me in welcoming our very last speaker of the day, Skye. Thanks so much, Renee, and for the whole team back here of putting everything together seamlessly. Um, it's nice to be on stage here in Bend. I've been hearing about Bend Design forever, um, and so it's, uh, it's great to be here, and I'll finally all be together. Um, and I need to use my clicker. So, and I don't know where to point it. There we go. Okay, so, you know, in coming up with a title and thinking about what kind of design do we want to see in the world, um, especially, you know, through the lens of our collaborative design and design systems program, but also in just the kind of my background and the work that I've been doing through time, I kind of want to walk you through my, it's gone way beyond infatuation at this point, it's just love for data, data-driven design, um, systems thinking, and how kind of I see us tying all of this into kind of design as a whole. Um, my background for years, uh, at least a decade, I sailed over 100,000 miles on the open ocean teaching undergraduates oceanography at sea. Um, and on these, you know, I, I love actually all of the different talks here today that had sketches that really makes me happy, the humanizing aspect. Um, these are just, you know, sketches from various islands. Most islands actually I didn't, <laughs> I didn't actually get to go to. I would just see from afar as we were sailing along. Um, but through these 20 different sea semesters, these different six week trips where we were mainly on the open ocean, but um, looking at the ocean through the lens of culture, through the lens of colonization, conservation, um, really understanding what most of the world looks like when you lose the horizon, and what does community mean when you don't have the internet, Woo and, um, and you know, getting to know each other, understanding people's laughter and you know, what people's different even sounds of their feet sound, you know, what does it mean to actually um, have meaningful engagement? And I feel like, for me, that has, that idea of meaningful engagement has transcended most of my work to this day. I also spent a lot of time um, running, a, running a paleo climate lab at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and working for the U.S. Antarctic program where a lot of our, uh, I did 10 trips, uh, the U.S. has two boats by the way along with three big bases including South Pole, McMurdo. You may have heard of some of these but if you're, if you're doing oceanographic research in the middle of winter it kind of looks, looks like this where um, instead of, you know, oh, it might be icy, a little cold, you get like extreme ice accretion and <laughs> to open any doors on deck, you, you have to get out some metal tools. Um, and then, but it's just stunning. The ocean is, is, you know, you get these big, on the left there, you see these big sheets of pancake ice um, that starts forming, gets bigger and bigger and ultimately becomes sea ice. And um, this particular trip, we were looking at, um, you know, krill, krill surveys, looking at um, well, what we actually set the, we do the science, the U.S. does the science that sets the krill quota every year for how much should the international world kind of fish for krill, which goes into all your omega-3 supplements um, based on, you know, what creatures need there. What is this ecosystem? What's it looking like? How's the plankton? What's this whole ecosystem looking like? So again, systems thinking, thinking about biodiversity as all of this ice is starting to melt. Antarctic Peninsula, just south of Chile, where this is, is one of the fastest um, melting, you know, fastest warming areas in the whole southern hemisphere. And so, you know, how do we start thinking about kind of the systems thinking? Um, how do we engage people with this continent that most people will never, 
even think about, but yet we all somehow are often using some of these materials. So again, this is all my science background. This is an, and then around this time I started thinking about design. Um, how do we start, you know, I literally started Googling um, communicating science, communicating de communication design, and I didn't know the difference between design and art. I was very naive. I was as science nerdy as it gets. I had a flip phone. I had a, you know, had never used an Adobe product or an Apple product. Um, and, but I ultimately ended up going to school at Art Center, College of Design um, for media. And media design ultimately took an information design class, loved it, um, kind of quit my, quit my time there, uh, went back to Antarctica, made a little more money, and then went to an information design MFA program at Northeastern. And um, where I, I fell in love with the idea of applying design to data and thinking about, well, how do we actually communicate? Data can be anything, right? It could be how many blue eyes are in this room or brown eyes or, you know, what do we all eat for breakfast and was it sustainable? You know, all these things. How do we actually create meaningful engagement about that? So, um, years of, you know, going to school, <laughs> thinking about, you know, how am I translating my career, ultimately ending up at a data viz studio in Portland called Periscopic, becoming their design director, teaching at PNCA for a long time, Pacific Northwest College of Art. Um, and now being the chair here, I'm teaching information design and I consistently um, am thinking about information in this way. It's, and in this order, um, if we want to engage anyone, we need to think about, well, who is this, who are we designing, you know, ideally with, but in some cases for, who is this for? Um, well, who is this work for and why do they need this information? And then, and then we can decide, okay, well, what form is best and how do we want to engage? Right, often as designers we find ourselves solutionizing and thinking about well, what's possible and ooh, wouldn't it be sexy if, and you know, we come up with this whole list of ideas that probably aren't our best ideas in the very beginning and then, and then we're like, oh yeah, but you know, do they actually care about this <laughs> and, and why do they need this information? Um, and you know, that will give us an idea of how sustainable is this, how scalable is this idea? Um, so this is kind of my premise in most of my work for in, te in teaching to think about this order. Um, we also have to think about how, when we see information, you know, visual literacy is increasing daily. Even in front of the New York Times, especially during the pandemic, has had so many, um, you know, full front page <laughs> visualizations of, of maps of, of um, who we've lost in, di you know, different depictions, narratives. And we can really frame visualization in these three ways. And this is uh, touted by Peter Hall. In 2011, um, he had a great, uh, great show at the Hammer Museum in LA. That was all about kind of how do we how do we visualize information, and he framed it in these three different ways, which I actually think are really helpful in thinking about well, when we see a visualization, why why does it seem scary or why might it seem really um, uh, accessible and interesting to us or why might it be you know something we don't understand but it looks cool, and we can think about it in three different ways. Um, Scientific visualizations are really about, um, you know, sharing domain knowledge. There might be axes, labels that we don't understand, but um, you know, our idea when we see a scientific visualization and when it when it looks like a scientific visualization, it's kind of jargony. Maybe it looks, um, you know, unbiased. It just seems like all this raw data. It tends to, you know, be bar graphs or line graphs. All these graphs of which were actually only just recently. Um, invented, you know, in the last few hundred years. It's not like these graphs have been around since Aristotle or something. The, our idea of how we visualize and encode information so that other people can decode it is really a rather new idea. So, um, so yeah, the idea of scientific visualization is no bias. But then we start, you know, if we want to communicate in newspapers and talk to people and and think about, you know, uh, creating you know, a little bit more narrowed, a little more accessibility, that becomes more journalistic. And you can think of all, any infographic you've ever seen, um, information graphics tend to be, um, you know, there might be some bias, I talked to you and I talked to you and I, I maybe didn't talk to some other people, but you know, we have a sense of what that looks like. And then artistic representations um, tend to kind of, you know, uh, reject or subvert the status quo and we might, you know, more and more that's becoming different kinds of forms of visualization. So it's not just graphs, but it's like in space or um, there's a whole movement about the quantified self where I'm, you know, thinking about, um, you know, how many times I'm visualizing how many times I looked in the mirror or whatever as, you know, blots of ink on a piece of paper or something. So 
Um, you know, art helps us think about what's possible and what happens if we combine a lot of these ideas. But the whole point here is, if I can use this guy, this, this spectrum of um, allowing us to explore data, allowing other people to explore data versus kind of just communicating insights, communicating narrative, we really have to think about that spectrum and what is it we are actually trying to do for our audience, how do we want them to engage, then what form is best. And, you know, data visualization might seem scary, but it's really just about donning the appropriate gear and, and applying, you know, design skills to data. So we want people to engage, we care about context, and we care about, you know, what scales are we making accessible for people. And so I can't help but, you know, have marine metaphors here. Um, so I think about, you know, if you want somebody to go snorkeling for the first time, that can seem really scary. It's uh, a place that where you can't breathe normally. Um, humans aren't meant to do this. And so first you have to have a snorkel to breathe underwater. How are you creating, you know, comfort, making this accessible to people? Are you using some, you know, bizarre typeface that is very illegible? Or are you trying to make something a bit more accessible for a broad audience? How small are you making the type? Can older people see this? Um, and then context. We want people to be able to see, understand what's the what systems does this, um, is this piece interacting with? And then uh, scale, you know, where are you trying to get them to snorkel around in? <laughs> and where, how, creating visual hierarchy, where do you want them to go? What, what thresholds do you want them to understand? How are you laying out visualizations um, specifically about data or information in a way that is um, where you're holding their hand and, and leading them along, um, you know, a kind of navigational path of, of your, you know, that you have decided on. So I'm going to show you some examples. Um, I'm actually not going to show you that last example. I switched that up. But <laughs> this is just some work that I've done for, um, for freelance work and for the group called Periscopic um, with the various clients that are listed at the top, NOAA and the Nature Conservancy, uh, Pacific Salmon Foundation and Urban Poor Consortium. Is that one on the right that was actually the most infographic one I've ever done? I'm going to show you a separate one. Um, so often scientists will come to me, and this is kind of my work straight out of grad school, where I, I have this marine hat that I can put on and say, okay, I understand marine science. And, and many scientists from all over the country, you know, they understand that there's all these systems involved with, say, lobster or something you care about, anything. Um, we'll, uh, we'll get to salmon in a second. But um, the East Coasters care about lobster and cod and and there's all kinds of um, physical constraints to habitat, just like we have temperature. They have salinity, oxygen, um, and then you have all kinds of different species pressures. We all know the basics about food webs. Um, and then you also have climate change, and you also have people fishing, and you also have all the cultural um, aspects that are important to people fishing in those areas. And so they would ask me to create um, <laughs> They would give me something like this that's interactive that has all these little pluses and minus arrows that indicate negative and positive pressures, which sounds scary, and it is because they gave me like 8,000 of these um, graphics. And I was tasked to make about 36 graphics that looked like this, where if like we're talking about lobster here in the middle, can I create a basic concept map with directional arrows that just, they want to have all of these conversations that are really important about like the future of our coastal critters, <laughs> all of them, um, from the, you know, seafloor up to the surface, and they want to know, well, who needs to be in the room? Who should we be talking to? Um, they, these people wanted to, these are government organizations, NOAA, it was National, Oce National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They want to have groups uh, at the table that are recreational fishermen, um, that are all the commercial fisheries. These are people who really care about the precarity of their jobs and their future livelihoods um, within their sectors. And then we also have scientists who really care about fishery stocks and, and you know, not, um, I mean, everybody cares about not depleting the ocean, but, um, and then, you know, all the people who are keeping track of climate change. And um, if you don't know, Cape Cod and North, this whole area, well, from like North Carolina up to um, Nova Scotia is the part of the Northern Hemisphere in the ocean that is warming the fastest in the world. Uh, so, um, People are really caring about, I feel like there's some reverb here, about, um, you know, uh, the future of this area. Likewise, similar scientists gave me things like this that look like, 
it's supposed to be showing you where, where with climate change all of these different creatures are going. And all of these little uh, tiny little words here stand for different species and it's really confusing and scientists love this. They use, they use a program called R or Python and they're like, yeah, sea sky, this is where all the creatures are going. Red, red creatures are, I think are warm and yellow creatures are, are the deep down dark ones, you know, living in the depths and um, blue and green are in the middle, obviously. And, you know, somehow this looks like some air traffic control, like mayhem. And if I'm, and they were like, we want this fisherman to be able to understand where they're, they're where their fish are going. Um, to me, this is chaos. And so we ended up creating a bunch of graphics that look something like this, that kind of gave kind of, kind of climate winners and climate losers. Um, unfortunately, lobster is a climate loser um, in the next 60 years or so. But looking at just where has, has the center of all of these species been in the last uh, 20 years and where is it going with climate change? And it's just like if we turned up the temperature in Bend, which is going to happen, I guess, um, you know, 20 degrees over the next 10 years, a fair number of us would be like, that's too hot, and we would move. Same things happen with fish. And so um, how you show these different uh, huge shifts in biomass is really important for communities and entire uh, uh, sectors of the economy that are traditionally really reliant on, on these, on these um, areas. And so... Um, you know, some these all of these little start areas are commercial fishing ports in these areas, and this shows that some of them might want to, um, you know, start fishing some something else. So we made this. We had probably 80 um, different sectors, uh, different um, creatures that we were looking at. Okay, and then the last one I'll show you here that's science yeah, it's scienced out before we get into the really pretty stuff is um, is just. I, I, most of my work has actually, in the last five years, been browser-based interfaces. So how do you really look at a lot of data and um, you know, create uh, really sophisticated web-based tools that are for multiple different stakeholders? And I don't like the word stakeholder, it's kind of a colonial term, but you know, different kinds of groups. Um, in this case, this is British, uh, British Columbia, has a group called Salmon Explorer. And the website here is just salmonexplorer.ca. And um, for all the watersheds in British Columbia, those Canadians, they have the most like microscopic, like the size of this stage would have its own data about the pH of this river and the temperature and how much salmon of all the different species kind of travel through here. Um, there's a big map up above this. This is just a screenshot. But so they have every unique species of, every unique kind of group of salmon. They keep track of, um, how many there are, uh, how they've changed over time, which ones are from hatcheries, how good is the data, like it's, it's, it's mind blowing. But the, how do you actually communicate this in a visual interface is part of the work that I've been, I've been doing over the last few years. Um, so I think I have one more slide of this, yeah. So they keep track of all of these things. Um, but the point here is that in all of these cases, we would, we would make prototypes um, using actual data because this is a long-term project and the main um, the, the main audience for this project was actually threefold and there were very different kinds of audience it was first peoples who care about food security and the future of salmon in a warming uh, part of the world um, uh, fisheries managers so they wanted to know about well we care about certain groups of fishes that we keep track of in groups so they're called standard monitoring units. So we had to like factor that in and make sure we had categories that tackled that. And then lots of developers were like, well, we want to put a wind farm in here and we want to build a hyd you know, hydro dam. <laughs> so we had to keep track of, um, we had kind of a future pressures, uh, current and future pressures area that looked at, well, you know, if I'm a developer, what do I care about? Um, so yeah, and then this last project I'll show you from Periscopic is just, I was asked by, and just this is just kind of showing you the suite of work here. This is a static project and being a GIF actually that went between this and this. Whoops, <gasps> I went to the beginning again. Oh wait, no, go back. Okay, um, it was asked to, for a demographers conference in um, Rostock, we were asked to uh, look at demographic data. So every country in the world that has been keeping track of this for a while, um, there's a whole, it's, it, this is like a dire topic, but mortality database 
Sweden has the oldest database in the world from 1751. Um, this does not include COVID. They haven't released it yet. I look like I look probably every two weeks to see if they've released the data yet. But you can see here years are on this axis and age of people who have passed away is here. And you can see over time, you can, um, we were asked to say, all, all these people are amazing mathematicians. They just do math all, all day long. And they had all of these um, formulas that I didn't really understand, but I did understand kind of the percentage of, um, you know, were they male or female? What age did they pass away? And then I could do research and say, okay, well, when did antibiotics happen? And why do we have this like wall of infant mortality um, up until like 1950? Also had to do with antibiotics and um, antibacterial, all kinds of things. Those of you who have kids probably know way more than me about that. Um, and then, you know, why do we have so many women? This is an area, blue here is two, two times more men dying than women. And pink is two times more women dying than men. And so I ended up playing with this, and I have it online, kind of my whole process of how I ended up with this visualization. But I ended up creating this and processing, um, which is a, well, Java and JavaScript now based software made for designers. So you can kind of like envision what you want and then design it and you know, feed an Excel file into it, which is really cool. I'll teach all of you guys about that someday if you want. Um, and we can look at kind of a whole area, uh, you know, it could be Oregon, it could be a whole country as a, as a landscape and look at where do we see peaks and valleys. And, and I'm really interested in design in the terms of like, how do we ask better and better questions? Um, this, I was like, what is what's happening here? And there was, it turns out that there were all kinds of um, abortions were illegal hmm. and um, we had you know, criminal abortions happening, which meant that people weren't going to actual doctors, and uh, many women in their 20s were dying at that time. It was just very, it's very specifically recorded. There were certain wars, there were famines, cholera happened, all kinds of things happened. And I was very, you know, more men died than women. Um, I'm very curious what will happen with COVID, you know, what, kind of, what, what we'll see, because a lot, of, a lot of people have passed away in Sweden, but they, they didn't have mandates for a long time on um, you know, staying indoors or masking or anything. So, um, but just the point of this is just um, not thinking, I'm really excited to think about like how can we encode data in ways that allow us to ask new questions and not just make visualizations that we've seen before, but um, help us think about what's possible. Uh, we can encode data in all kinds of ways. Not, you know, we think about a bar graph, okay, that's length. Data equals length, well what about um, food can data equal, you know, how, how charred something is or how salty it is or how sweet it is. There's a whole group called Data Cuisine, which you should check out. Okay. Um, so now I want to talk about, you know, designing with people rather than for people. Collaborative design is all about um, participatory engagement. How do we make sure that we are not just designing for people, which has traditionally been um, kind of the design thinking process since the, you know, 60s. Um, and how, in this specific couple of examples, I'm going to show you how I've done that with kind of thinking about new, new types of form and engagement um, and how to really think about uh, environmental justice um, through the lens of the, the form of data-driven design. So for my MFA thesis, I had traveled a lot to Antarctica, as I mentioned, and um, People are like, oh, cool, Antarctica, is it cold there? People always ask like the same basic questions. And, but really, they just want to know, they, they just don't know what to ask, right? And I don't know why not, because like, I don't even know what to tell you. Is this Antarctica? Is this Antarctica? Like on every map type, those of you who have worked with any kinds of projections, maps completely distort Antarctica. Like, is it that, is that bigger than the United States? Like, um, and so we actually don't have a good understanding, and so most people will never go there, right? And so if I want to engage people with Antarctica, and I want to engage people with, um, you know, the, all the amazing creatures that are there underneath the water, when I've been doing all these scientific cruises, we're pulling up creatures that are like, you know, man-sized yellow sponges, and giant sea stars, and rays, and purple octopus, and these crazy little pink um, things called uh, sea pigs that look, they're like the size of my hand, they look like a little pink water balloon with little legs sticking on they feel like a water balloon too um, but if I show them pictures like this you know they start to get a sense of oh wow yeah I've heard of the Drake passage that's scary and oh wow and I can you know you can kind of with a few visuals you can start to create something that is a little more 
um, engaging. I tried the last trip. I did a little reunion tour in 2018. I did a three-week cruise down there. Um, uh, you know, still actually working at the Pacific Northwest College of Art. Just took a few weeks off and um, and ended up trying to people. I was realizing that people don't really even understand what the ocean looks like. Antarctica, the ocean, it's just is it? It's just blue, right? It's I see it on a globe, like nah. Like when you're flying over it, um, you know, you see clouds mainly. And when it's dark and you have the little like airplane and you're looking at the airplane flying over things, the, the ocean just looks like a gray. You know, it's gray or white, right? And so I decided to paint the ocean just for half an hour every day after work. It was it was summertime there. It was December, so it's the Austral summer in it. Uh, so after my 12-hour work day, I. Painted, um, painted the ocean every day, and just, just, just look at, just show off like the nuance and how different it is in the Straits of Magellan when we're leaving Chile, um, headed out there, um, and then how, you know, how, um, how rough it is, and, and just, just the straight up colors and, and textures, um, and there's just like again this humanizing element of the, of the hand drawn, which I think I really love. Obviously, I'm biased. We, look, we were at an art school, um, we get to see all the stuff on the walls all the time. So, um, but when you Google Antarctica, you know, you see something that looks like, like this. Um, beautiful, perfect sunny days, tourists with a giant ice arch, you know, like it's, um, it's, and if you, you may notice that all of these pictures are above the surface. We're slightly biased as humans. Um, but again, underwater, I was pulling up all these, for science, all these unbelievably colorful, bizarrely colorful creatures. Um, every sea star type you can possibly imagine, like sea star arms that like then divide into other sea stars. That anyway, like wild. And um, so I decided to think about how can I communicate that this area is warming really fast, um, faster than anywhere else in the southern hemisphere. Um, I've seen it with my own eyes, and you see huge, you know, pieces of um, anything blue is was a you know um, a glacier that. Um, is you know millions of years old, at least tens of thousands of years old, eh, maybe more. Um, pretty old. Um, and uh, you know, and so I decided to take 100 photographs, 50 photographs that I had taken above the surface in in Antarctica, and 50 photographs from below that a friend of mine who works on the National Geographic boats um, in the summer down there, um, when there's nice good light, um, he works. He's taken a ton of photos in the same area underwater, and he lives in Portland. And um, so I asked him, hey, can I have 50 of your, you know, kind of more colorful photos of different creatures? I'll use 50 photos that I have of the surface. And then I used, um, again, processing uh, made for artists and designers to uh, subsample the, the image, just like you would sub, just like if you were pulling kind of every 10th letter off of a page of a book. And I took all of those little letters, all of those pixels, and I stacked them in a vertical bar. And then I sorted them in RGB order. Um, and so you kind of see these little vertical bars here. <clears throat> and I subsampled the, the, the ones under the water a little bit more just because I wanted to kind of show off the color area a little bit more. And so I ended up making this static poster um, while I was doing my MFA and published it in Popular Science um, that's just, uh, you know, kind of highlighting this, this sea surface here of, um, well, you can tell I'm nervous. It's like, wah, uh, that highlights this juxtaposition of, wow, we really think of Antarctica as white, gray, blue, but underwater, wow, look, there's crazy dragonfish and purple sea stars and yellow sponges. Um, so I wasn't, again, I want to create this for people. This is cool. I've had lots of people weirdly like reach out to me and want to make a quilt out of this. Um, but I really wanted to make it interactive, and I wanted people to be able to actually engage and interact with this and actually um, not to be too teachy about it, but just, again, if there, we've talked a lot about beauty today, but appreciate the beauty and see these creatures. Um, and so I made a gestural interface. Um, there's something called a leap motion. It's about half the size of your, maybe a quarter the size of your iPhone. It has infrared sensors that you can move your hand over it and, um, and you know, kind of use it kind of like a, like a mouse in space and select X, Y axes. And so um, this ended up being a... Uh, an exhibition called Life at the Edges at Science Gallery in Dublin that was all about life in extreme environments. And um, you can see someone moving, kind of selecting each little pixel bar like a piano key. The image would appear. You can actually zoom in and out with it. Um, really fun interface. I really am terrible at code. And 
I was able to do this with a little bit of help. <laughs> so you can too. Um, but gestural interfaces are super fun and I frankly think that they're the future. Um, if some of you may have like remotes like that and stuff already. But um, And so I want to talk about something that kind of bridges um, my background. When, when I was sailing on all those different trips, the sea semester trips, um, teaching oceanography, I started hearing about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And I had been to, in the Pacific, I had been all over the Atlantic, the middle of the Atlantic, and we do, we always do trips uh, looking at every noon and every midnight, we put a net in the water, we look for plankton, we count how many pieces of tar there are, plastic. We've been doing that since the 70s, and like had pretty good data fidelity since the 80s. And so I started, um, this is a, this is a, a uh, from my journals, a trigger fish had followed these two, a, a bunch of trigger fish, these gray fish, if you've ever been snorkeling, they live in very tropical reef environments. We found this, um, all of these trigger fish out in the middle of the ocean, looking at, um, following an orange bucket that had also floated along with the yummy little algae to eat all over it. And um, when we caught it, I, we caught a couple of them with a bunch of plastic. Um, 23,000 pieces of plastic were actually in that tow. And, but they could all fit in the size, you know, in a, in a five gallon bucket. Like these things were all sand grain sized pieces. And what we don't understand, we're like, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and plastic vortex, you know, a floating landfill, these like hyperbolic images in our minds, these mental models that we create kind of um, distort and not kind of, they totally distort <laughs> and make us think um, that the, pro the problem is very different than it is. And it's not that it's a, not a terrible problem, but it's just a very different problem in how we think about our engagement with that problem and what we need to do as citizens who create a lot of plastic waste that ends up in the ocean. Um, so a lot of the work that I did, I put together the world's largest inventory of plastic in the ocean from these different um, primarily educational trips. We published in Science, which is the, you know, Science and Nature, the big academic journals out there. Um, this was kind of how much plastic is in the Atlantic, how much is in the Pacific, what kind of plastic is it? How does wind affect how much that you're going to see? Um, and then, you know, can teachers engage with this information? And um, we actually, this is way more probably everybody's style here, mine included now. We created a 45 minute film called Into the Gyre, um, a documentary that, that goes out into that middle of the ocean where we caught those trigger fish actually, and you see me filleting and squeezing out the stomach of the plastic. It's, it's, kind of, it's really special. <laughs> You'll see my, my uh, yeah, like 25 year old self. Um, but again, like all of these, you know, this, it's kind of cool data, but it's all very sciencey. And these are like, you know, scientific, again, scientific visualizations where I can't show this, well, I can't show this to my mom or, <laughs> but I can't show this to my dad and have him understand what this means. Uh, my mom's a scientist. My dad is a crop duster, very different. They, they divorced when I was six. Um, okay. <laughs> So, um, so where all this ended up is, is you know, I, I've been doing visualization. I took that data cuisine workshop that I was telling you about data cuisine. What else can data, how else can we encode data? And I, at the time that I took that cuisine workshop, um, back in 2016, Mort Stefaner, who's a, a kind of famous data visualization guy, he knew about my plastics work. And he, at the time, there was this National Geographic Ocean Plastics Innovation Challenge. And they're like, we have a, they're, they're kind of three tracks, kind of how do we not have um, petrochemical plastic? Can we make it out of something else? How do we not have, that was one track. How do we not have waste? Can, can we have circular economies? Can I reuse, you know, my, my paper cup a zillion times, or my plastic cup? Um, and then, you know, there was this tiny little kind of data visualization track that was the venture capitalists who were co-sponsors co didn't care about that as much, but they're like, oh, good, it's National Geographic. And so we, we put a proposal in to do a big data art installation in Bali. And we ended up getting the initial funding um, for me to fly there, win, winning, to, yeah, ended, we ended up making um, with Lena Klaus, who is an artist there in Bali. She's also German, though. Um, so it was me and two Germans. And we created this huge 50-foot diameter data art installation that was um, visualizing the fate of all plastic ever made. And so, um, I'll show you more pictures of it in a second, but basically, you know, when we think about ocean plastics, most people think about, oh, a flip-flop or, you know, um, a, you know, container, a single-use container or whatnot. But the reality is that 
it's all tiny little pieces. <laughs> it's all under the size of your you know, fingernail. And so what, while all of our competitors in this challenge thought about, um, were thinking about ocean plastics, um, specifically through the lens of kind of bigger pieces of plastic, what might that look like? How can we make online uh, tools that people can engage with? We decided to actually think about well, what is the actual problem here? And can the data that we're using, can the visualization be the form that we're talking about? Can the Excuse me, can the form be the data that we're talking about? Um, and so uh, we created this giant, again, 46 foot um, art installation, um, lots of prep before time, doing beach cleanups, kind of curating the beach, Lena calls it, um, for different colors of flip flops, and she didn't color any of these things. Um, but the data from 2015 um, was from a, from a scientific academic journal article, which not surprisingly, it's proprietary, so you have to, you know, if you want to read this paper, you have to pay money. Um, 8.3, at the time, 2015, 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic had been created on the planet. Most of that since 1950s. 60% um, had been discarded. 60%, um, and that problem, this is the stuff that ends up in the middle of the ocean, there's a huge mismanagement problem, right? Lots of people don't know, including the U.S. The U.S. has 2% mismanaged waste. 2% of our waste ends up in the ocean or in our environment. Um, six, you know, seven percent is recycled, nine has been incinerated, and twenty-four percent is still in use. So, um, that's about nine billion now, by the way. So, the original graphic in the in the article that none of us can access unless we want to pay for it. <laughs> I have a, I can go off about uh, proprietary publishing all day if you want later at the cocktail hour. Um, but we created the original graphic, took the original graphic that was kind of confusing. Um, I mean, a good effort made on the scientists to kind of visualize their data. That doesn't happen all the time. We recreated it, recreated it as a Sankey diagram or a flow diagram, showing where these things go, bent it in a circle because people love circles. We wanted to kind of show this in space. And here's the drone shot from the final day. Um, the next morning, actually, it took 12 hours to put together. Um, and then another, uh, 12 hours put together and then overnight um, <laughs> the tide came up right when we came back and so we had to re repair this section a little bit. We got all the pieces back. Um, but this is a good kind of, the point was that we put it next to this river showing that the plastic is coming from land, um, which is a uh, missing part of the narrative in a lot of ocean plastic work and that a lot of the mismanaged waste, the white part ends up in the ocean. Um, so this is the piece, that's, uh, that's me. Um, uh, this is the final piece, and we had yeah a handful of volunteers. The nice thing about doing this this collaborative work is that Lena lives there. She does a lot of work with people, with kids, with different groups, um, working to clean the beach to make a more awareness about um, the kind of lack of uh, uh, like rubbish system that they have there. We. Um, we, as in like white people, the, the Dutch, I don't know if you know this, colonized um, Indonesia for 400 years and did a great job building canals and all kinds of places for, you know, getting goods in and out of there, um, but left them, you know, kind of with really no, no good fresh water system, no sewage system, no trash system, all these things. And then there were some wars that kind of left everybody in shambles and, and um, there's a lot of what we see there now with our, our kind of um, different economies of um, our monthly economy of how we live, you know, which is um, bottles of detergent and, you know, we, we think about what I'm trying to get at is often we are pointing fingers to Southeast Asia as like, well, they're the plastics problem when we are in fact um, creating the global economy systems that are not daily economies like people live on in lots of parts of the world, but monthly economies, we pay monthly rent and thinking about um, you know, designing um, products for systems in which we have in the United States that can deal with these kinds of, um, kinds of trash and such. So anyway, um, this was a really cool project because it allows us to think about that macro view of like literally zooming out what you saw from the drone. And then all these little kind of micro, you know, kind of closer up stories looking at hotel slippers. Do people need hotel slippers? They use them once. Where do they end up going? Each. Um, and I was totally amazed at how many um, uh, toothpaste tubes were on the beach as well. Blew my mind. Anyway, so the last couple things I'll show you are um, a project that's currently at University of Toronto Art Museum. Um, based, uh, I was commissioned. I was commissioned by Synthetic Collective, which is a group um, out of Canada 
that had done a, a, is very interested in plastics. Um, Kelly Jazzback contacted me. She's, she came up with the word plastiglomerate, which is that new kind of Anthropocene word about rocks that are kind of rock and plastic together um, that they've been discovering in the big, on the Big Island. But they did this huge project with some of the scientists on their team in their collective looking at plastic nurdles or plastic pellets, how the world ships plastic, industrial pellets. They're little hamburger size. You can see the size according to their, that person's finger. They're like two, three millimeters. And so um, they, they went all over the Great Lakes, 60 plus different sites, and they uh, counted how much plastic was on the beach. And they um, wanted to show, in, in some places there were lots of, you know, 900 pieces in one square meter, like kind of wild amounts. And so she wanted me, they wanted me to, for this, um, this show right now, this big exhibition, it's up until November to, to create a giant map. And most of the time, actually, clients, it's really bad. Like, when clients tell me, like, I want a map, I generally, it's, like, not probably the best idea. There's probably other ways you can kind of um, encode the data that's much more exciting. But in this case, um, when you look at the Great Lakes, it's kind of clear that they're the Great Lakes. It made sense in this case. And primarily, it's a more of a fine art exhibition about plastics and their, um, you know, prevalence. And so <clears throat> I ended up creating a... Uh, kind of data representations, these kind of little shards. I was thinking about how crystals and kind of things grow in places or mold and cracks where you don't want it to. And so I worked with a Pacific Northwest College of Art alum to create, he came up with this hyperlocal recycling system in his garage. He'd been working in the plastics industry forever. And we molded um, plastics that you can't typically recycle, like uh, six pack lids and um, uh, Amazon bags, lots of Amazon bags, especially in COVID times. and. Um, you know, caution tape, all kinds of things. We molded them into these pieces, and um, they gave me this 27-foot long wall, and I was kind of able to show off, um, kind of had a, had a legend, that, um, and I was able to show off how, you know, kind of where in the Great Lakes these different plastic amounts were, and where also did we not see any of these? Little, there was a little, like, piece of linen. The cool thing about this whole, I urge you to check out this, um, this whole uh, exhibit, um, this piece was called Thank You to Our Industrial Partners. Um, I know, cheeky, but it was my best. It was the best one I, title I got. But, um, but the cool thing about this whole exhibition and what's really exciting, again, it's called Plastic Heart Surface All the Way Through, is that the, the constraints of this whole exhibit were to not, to be carbon neutral. Everything had to be able to be recycled or um, reused. So that really, and even thinking about, like, I couldn't go there and install it because that would be, you know, me getting on a plane. And so how do we think about what goes into an art, you know, even vinyl on the walls? That was a no-go. Everything on the wall ended up being hand stenciled on or hand drawn. Um, and so just thinking about all these little decisions that we make. Um, the ultimate website that this specific um, exhibition has, kind of aside from the University of Toronto Art Museum page, is actually solar solar powered and so it goes down at night when it, the, the sun is down in Montreal. So thinking about, well, how do we even like, what, you know, what energy goes into creating things that we look at on a browser? What are, how, how do browsers work? So anyway, I've been thinking a lot about scale, a lot about ocean stuff, a lot about plastics. Um, I, I, you know, have an essay coming out in a book that's all about kind of the planetary problem of scale. And obviously this makes us think of the Eames. Um, the Eames were, uh, Charles and Ray Eames obviously were famous designers, um, but they were insatiably curious. Uh, you know, I, I've heard people talk about designers in terms of like goats and sheep and, and how sheep tend to be, um, you know, your typical kind of, and I've done service design, obviously it's not all like this, but you know, your, your designers that are kind of afraid of risk and um, kind of keep track of convention and are, are pretty predictable. And then you have um, goats like Charles and Ray Eames that are more, you know, insatiably curious and care about um, different scales of knowledge. And they created this film. I don't know if you all, did people see this? Powers of Ten. Oh, it's so good. It's like nine minutes. Definitely Google it as soon as you get home. Um, but it's based on this, like, couple in Chicago, and they're having a picnic. They have a couple books, some apples. They're, like, reading. And, oh, I think I have another slide that just shows this better. Yeah, here they are. And they're like, here's a, here's a couple in Chicago. And like, you know, 10 by 10 meters. Now we can see this is the amount of uh, distance that a dog can run in 10 seconds or whatever. And um, 
And the whole point of their work was thinking about how, what kind of knowledge do we know at this scale? And you know, as it goes out farther and farther, it gets a little, CG wasn't as good in those days, it gets a little, you know, then we, then we zoom into the guy's hand and it's like, oh, what does an atom look like? And, um, but the whole point is that they were like, yeah, let's think about what we do know and what we don't know and what questions should be asked and answered. And um, if you're ever in Boston at the Boston Science Museum, they have a whole, there's a whole Eames exhibit about math. Like these guys were just like, let's think about these things and keep going and ask better questions. And so we can zoom in and out and think about even design questions and working with people, um, whether it's plastic, whether it's um, ideas about, you know, energy in the future and how are we going to create equitable energy. Um, we can zoom in and out, but we can also think about, again, what about different, what about, what if that instead of being like a group, you know, if a couple in Chicago was in a different country or, you know, what are the conversations that are happening? What about the same scale? If we start thinking about designing across, um, you know, in the same scale across different, uh, different parts of society, um, a group called Future Farmers is a design studio that really is a group of archit uh, architects, designers, um, anthropologists, writers, and Future Farmers is uh, kind of took this idea that the Eames had, and they said, well, what if we think about, um, you know, scale just on the idea of like a picnic, like what, what fits on this picnic blanket? What actually is on this picnic blanket? Okay, we have a book, we have some apples again, I think there was a magazine. Like, how does that context, that perspective, change what this couple is actually talking about and what they care about? What are they going to buy if we're designers and we're designing for them? What about other people? And so I love this book. Um, you can, it's, it ended up being a book because they look at a bunch of different, they, they talk about scale as in the scale of the conversation that these people might be having. This group was talking about, um, you know, one group might be talking about space and interstellar, you know, planetary stuff, and another group might be talking about microbial ecology, and what um, what food and what books might be on their picnic blanket as opposed to others. Um, this is a, a, a UC Berkeley professor, Abina Dove Oseo Asari, who was um, her whole uh, her work at UC Berkeley investigates what's uh, kind of how pharmaceutical companies are impacting traditional, um, not kind of traditional um, kind of gardening knowledge about you know, tr medicinal plants in that area that are literally being threatened by companies that are like, oh, well, that works. We're going to come in and take all of it. So, um, what would be on her picnic blanket in terms of, um, you know, in Ghana where she's doing some of this work? Oops. Uh, you know, she and she kind of lists the books, the journals that she would have, what kind of food is more appropriate for those perspectives. So, you know, just to, to conclude here for a few slides, I really feel that design, my, my definition of design is design is asking better questions. And I'm really interested and engaged with my, you know, with students, with, with anybody, with what are critical entry, what can design do? What are critical entry points into these um, for whatever we think the problem is, we're not trying to solve the problem, we're trying to understand the problem and ask questions about the problem. Why is this problem happening? What feedback loops are happening? Um, you know, I, I see our collaborative design program as kind of this Venn diagram of design, um, applied systems thinking, and participatory research and participatory engagement. And so, what are opportunities for interrogation? What design interventions might be in working with people um, to kind of um, empower other people to, you know, empower other people to keep asking these kinds of questions. Um, some of the work that I showed you, including that, um, the, the kind of 30 minute sketches of, of kind of how do we know what we know about the ocean? Is it blue? Is it teal? I don't know. Um, and, and some of the plastics work, uh, thinking about scale or in these books coming out this year soon from this publishing group called Kaverlag. And some of my previous work has, is, is in these publications at the left, um, including the Data Cookbook earlier this year. So I'd encourage you all to, you know, be insatiably curious, be a goat, not a predictable sheep. Um, you know, I, I can reel on capitalism all day, but I think capitalism is, thinks that there are no limits, right? A lot of investors think there are no limits. And, I think systems thinking threatens that idea, which is why we don't see a lot of design programs focusing on systems thinking. 
and I couldn't be more excited about the, the opportunities for creative and you know, justice-focused approaches to design. And so, you know, if you want to, you know, talk to any of the students here in the audience about, about the program, um, and uh, I hope to answer any questions later. Thanks. I was going to ask you about Ant Antarctica. Is it cold there? I'm just kidding. I'm not going to ask you that question. Um, thinking of design thinking principles and empathy, could you speak a bit more about how you see the role of empathy in shifting our socio-environmental interactions? I think empathy is all about perspective and pers you know understanding the world from a different perspective and if you don't you know you can kind of think about that but if you don't ask questions and do research and you know whether it's primary research secondary research understanding who who you're designing with mm -hmm. then you know I, I don't think your work is going to have the layer of depth that 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 it needs to for us to have valuable conversations so when you start a project what are the different methodologies of question asking you mm. engage with or teach your students to look at my first recommendation is to ask as many questions as possible <laughs> like list as many you know as possible what do i know what do i not know what are known knowns what are known unknowns what are unknown unknowns what am i not be thinking about um, start grouping these questions into something that might be more meaningful, have other people ask these questions to people they know, again, like with the idea of empowerment and perspective sharing that, you know, my group of friends might be very different than somebody else's conversations. And so expanding, um, yeah, just continuing to ask better and better questions. And then ideally we, we ask a lot of questions through making. And so it's not just asking you, you know, verbally, but can I make something where, that might facilitate um, discussion and I might hear something that might, you know, engage my curiosity to help me ask better mm -hmm. questions that I might have not ever thought of otherwise. Do you use any ethnographic type research? We teach, the students have an ethnographic research class where we're thinking about, um, yeah, user research for sure. Mm -hmm. okay. I love this subject. All right, but we all want to have a drink soon, right? So I won't keep asking questions about questions. All right. Um, so it seems on the surface that science and design measure success very differently. As someone bridging those disciplines, is that something you have found to be true or not true? Second part of the question. And what are your metrics for judging if the project is a success? Wow, it totally depends on the project. Um, but I will, I will leave you with a better answer. Scientists and designers, they both want to create impact and they're curious and they want to see you know, see the magic happen, <laughs> whatever that looks like to you. Um, the scientists and designers are both, you know, we, we're always learning and I think that's why we love, like people are gonna pay us to keep learning and we can ask, have more valuable conversations through continuing to learn and, you know, be more knowledgeable about something. And so I think the idea of encoding our information or how we're engaging in a way that is meaningful, that we can create meaningful impact is shared, but I think success metrics and how the frankly how the hierarchical kind of knowledge sharing systems have been set up in those two groups mm -hmm. is very different right proprietary academic journals of domain knowledge sharing versus um you know obviously there's been a whole array of speakers today that would would think about their success in different ways mm -hmm. um but i think i personally think success is making sure that all parties you know every every and I don't want to say, you know, just marginalized groups, different, you know, who haven't we thought of, who's missing? We do a lot of, um, in terms of asking questions, thinking about who's not a part of this conversation, right. who created the, you know, kind of what power metrics are in, inherent in how we even think about this information. And so I think that's true in science as well as design and making sure that we're keeping track of all the different conversations and understanding who's a part of these different, you know, who who is, who are we not thinking about that needs to be thought about in terms of, are we creating meaningful impact or not, or adverse consequences, or? Right, and I'm assuming um, you might set a goal at the beginning of the project, but it can shift as you learn more. 
correct? Yeah, self-reflection, mm -hmm. dynamism, yeah. Um, well, it's clear that environmental justice and data visualization are passions of yours, but also your students. So we'd love to hear about how important you feel it is to teach and engage the next generation with collaborative design. I can't say enough um, about just teaching, you know, whether it's in the, in the classroom, in bed, um, <laughs> at sea, how important it is to have the conversations that that students ask that that and ideally from a bunch of I love collaborative design program I'm sorry I'm like I, I feel like it's like my child or something but <laughs> but I what's cool about um, this program is that students are coming from all different backgrounds from biology from from the beauty industry from um, sociology from you know music from all these different backgrounds and they all want to change the world, but they realize they can't do it by themselves. And so um, the conversations that we have and things we're helping each other keep track of and um, kind of our, all of our different culminated like ideas of what impact means and what meaningful engagement means are all so different. And being able to have those kinds of conversations, I, when I was just working at a design studio, I realized that was really, I was really missing just the conversation and mm -hmm. <laughs> using my brain in that way. And um, I think that's what we all love love doing and hopefully get to continue to do in our various workplaces. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Sky. And I encourage all of you to chat with her this evening about the program. And thank you for sharing with us.